So let's launch into it then. I'll probably take about, what, um, half an hour to 40 minutes, something like that on this, and then we can then we can go into chat. So, good. Um, now, the very first papers that we have any record of uh, is the actor Dierna. I've got to move this annoying bar out of the way. There we go. Um, that was essentially government notices put up in public squares. It started during the days of um, uh, Julius Caesar and continued forward for um, about three centuries. But essentially, these were big stone tablets, sometimes metal tablets, in which the news of the day was um, acta diurna, so daily acts or daily news or daily happenings, uh, were put up on these, these metal plates or these stone plates for the public to read. And sometimes it, it would go beyond just straight government news and also cover important, you know, births, weddings and, and what have you. And that was um, a little island of high civilization from the Romans, but then it all went dark until about the 1500s when the same method popped up again across Europe. Space bar, space bar. And then you see, um, starting in uh, Venice, actually, in the 1500s, um, there were a few governments around Europe, uh, local governments, that started making available notices of what was going on. But what the Venetian government did is it set up this very regular written notes that it would put out and make purchasable to the public for one coin, one Gazetta coin. And that term then came to denote the paper itself. Um, it spread around Europe as kind of like, this is what a, a, a Gazetta or a Gazette is. And then it was quickly picked up in other countries. And so when you get into the 1600s, you see the first real French newspaper Gazette de France launch, later just called La Gazette, um, also in Portugal, a Gazette de Restauração. How have I, did I pronounce that right? I don't know. Then also in Madrid, and then there was the Oxford Gazette, which later became uh, the London Gazette. But this notion of, of having written news that was at first written, but then people started using the print press for it, of course, um, became a very European model of sharing news around Europe. And in fact, before you had the Oxford uh, Gazette, probably the first written news in English was actually trading news in Amsterdam, where traders that were moving around the different ports of Europe and moving goods would take news from different principalities or locations and cross-translate them in these trading hubs to spread news thusly. However, um, the news was certainly in England very, very tightly controlled at that stage. So um, you had, um, you know, it was identified early as being quite a threat um, because it was control of information. So in 1585, under Queen Elizabeth I, the, uh, the royal court called the Star Chamber had a look at this and decided that it didn't like the idea of, of news in the kingdom at all. And no one was allowed to put out any news that was the preserve of uh, the queen. And so effectively, news was banned. However, all of this broke down um, when after um, uh, Elizabeth I died and then uh, King uh, James came in and there was the Union of the Crowns and you only just got past him before then England uh, fell into a uh, civil war about the, the powers of the crown. As soon as the English Civil War kicked off and there was that lawlessness, there were hundreds of what was called news books at the time, where propaganda back and forth was sloshing around all of England. Little, so the printing press was used to make rapid books that would update 
uh, different factions around the country on different news. And so the Royalists had a whole bunch of their own and the Roundheads had a whole bunch of their own and it went pretty wild. But the power of the press uh, was really discovered then. However, after um, the English Civil War ended and then uh, you had uh, the, the, the protectorate and then you had the restoration of King Charles coming to the throne, it was decided that, that this needed a bit more control now. So uh, King Charles came back to the throne in what was that? I can't see the date there, but from memory, 1660. And then a couple of years later, there was the Printing Act which meant that you can't print news unless you have a special license from the King or the Queen. And so the Oxford Gazette, later the London Gazette, was pretty much the major publication that had license from the Crown in order to print news. Not many others had that. So the press at the time was very restricted, despite lots of petitions to open it up. However, in, um, and it lapsed a couple of times before 1695. And there, there were motions from people to, um, to set up new titles. Um, and then as the controls came back in, try to get them approved. But it lapsed permanently in 1695. And that became known as the point of the freedom of the press, because no longer from that point on, did you have to have a license from the king or queen in order to make a publication like the Times or the Mirror or what have you? You could just set it up and it was a business. So that, when you get into the, uh, the 1700s, caused a big explosion of the press. Suddenly, lots of titles, including various ones that, that are familiar to us today, started opening up. And one of the main places where that happened, not just in, in, in Britain, but in the world, was in Fleet Street, uh, because Fleet Street was already set up to um, print lots of books. You know, the printing press had been invented in the, in the 1400s um, and Fleet Street had been at it. And in fact, there was a massive explosion of printing of books across Europe from the 15th century through to the 18th, you went from, you know, a few hundred uh, a thousand copies being produced to by the um, end of the 1800s, uh, um, one point something billion. So anyway, the, the whole printing business was exploding anyway, but now you could turn your hands to making news. And the extra advantage of making news was all the advertisers wanted to be on it. So it was actually a very lucrative business, even from the early 1700s, because advertisers realized that you could get yourself into pamphlet form, telling people about your wares to whatever city you were being printed in. Now, at this time, with this explosion of titles, um, you also saw the emergence of journalism as a profession and the notion of being a journalist. And even though most of those early papers did not have a byline who this is written by, because it was usually either one man doing it or it was a team that just did it as a team, um, it was the spectator, uh, the very short-lived spectator in uh, 1711 to 1712, not to be confused with the spectator nowadays, because that actually borrowed its name from this famous spectator that only lasted for two years, but nevertheless was very influential, partly because it, um, it allowed the authors to put their articles out with pseudonyms, with uh, pen names. So they developed their own styles and it was known who was writing something, not with their real names, uh, but with pen names. Now, actually, the Spectator closed in 1712 because, as you'll see in the next slide, uh, there was um, the government put in heavy taxes quite early on with this explosion, the stamp tax, partly to, to, to measure growth of papers, but also partly to try and stop them from going wild. And that was too much for the Spectator, so it only lasted two years. 
But um, but shortly after that, you saw the emergence of more bylines, more known journalists emerging, and they started to get reputations quite early on. So the good uh, Dr. Johnson, uh, the famous essayist of the time, by 1758, was already proclaiming on the nature of journalists. Um, the news writer is a man without virtue who writes lies at home for his own profit. To these compositions, meaning, you know, the stuff that they were writing, I've taken out a chunk here, contempt of shame and indifference to the truth are absolutely necessary. So even back in the mid-1750s, you're already seeing journalists with um, a reputation for being, you know, a bit wild, and you're already seeing it as a profiteering industry because, of course, it's about the spread of that. You get money not just from the sale of it, but the advertising revenue was already there. And this was the first explosion. But then something happened that caused a secondary explosion on top of that as you get into the 1800s. And that's, that was several things that happened at the same time. So firstly, the printing press really stepped up a gear. Um, first of all, it went from that old model that, that you could you can see there, the, the sort of like a flat model, which was wood and metal, um, to a new model, which was cast iron, which allowed um, a lot of pressure to be applied a lot more quickly. It was a more efficient device. And that actually doubled the productivity um, of the printing press. But that only lasted about a decade or, or even less than that before the new steam powered press came along. So the first versions of that were, were you know, about 1802 and then it got improved, patented in 1810, got even better in 1814. But essentially, um, uh, Koenig's uh, steam press also incorporated this notion of instead of having a flatbed, you just print by pulling something through cylinders. And very shortly after he, he increased the production even more. So we're going from something like, you know, 240 pages per hour to 1,100 pages per hour in the span of just about a decade. Um, he then developed it to be printing on both sides. And, you know, took this straight to London. So suddenly you had steam powered printing presses in London. You had much cheaper production and much larger circulation. And then you had on top of that even more freedom of the press because there was the repeal of the stamp tax on newspapers in 1855 and the repeal of the paper duty in 1861. Both of those were important, but probably the repeal of the stamp tax was more important. It meant that previously, um, you know, from about 1712, when the stamp tax started, that if you wanted to sell a paper, it, you had to pay money for that paper to be stamped. Money goes to the government for it, and the government records that as an ins incident of that paper being sold. Usually it could be sold to shops or to clubs where people would circulate it. But nevertheless, the government took uh, a hefty levy on all newspapers being sold. Um, but when that, uh, when that got repealed in 1855, and then when the paper duties, actual charges on the, on the producers themselves of paper, that got repealed as well, then suddenly with the steam press, it was all cheap as chips. And that's what led in the late 1800s to this explosion of the penny press, which was getting further and further into the working classes around the country and into rural areas around the country as literacy was increasing and it was all more affordable and news was more important to people's daily lives. And thanks to the stamp tax on newspapers, well, how do I go back? You could, act, there we go. You could actually see, um, if you look at the bottom of the screen, um, it was measurable, and back in 1713, the year after it came in, there were 2.4 million copies of newspapers sold in that year in total. But by the time you're getting into the mid-1800s, it's 78 million. So um, 
it was really, really exploding. And then that was before the stamp tax and the paper duty uh, were both repealed. And then so it, it exploded further after that, and but wasn't really measured by the government as such. Right. So that means that by the time that you get into the early 1900s now, um, some of these papers are really well established, have national reach and very lucrative. And they are big business and they're starting to accumulate power. And you have um, uh, some press barons emerging. So in the early 1900s, um, before World War I, you had Alfred Harmsworth and his brother Harold Harmsworth um, built a company together that controlled a lot of titles. I'll, I'll go into that in a bit. You had Max Aitken, um, who became Lord Beaverbrook, a Canadian who came over and acquired the Express. And you also had the Berry brothers, who Lord Camrose and Lord Kemsley. And between them, they controlled a vast amount of the news. Now, um, Lord Northcliffe, who was probably the biggest and earliest innovator on, on mass media in newspapers, he died in 1922 and handed over the entire group um, of, of their press titles to his younger brother, Harold uh, Harmsworth, Viscount Rothermere, um, and uh, because he had no, uh, he had no legitimate children of his own. He did have four children of his own, but they were all illegitimate. So anyway, it was it was his little brother that got the title. But in 1937, those four remaining people, Harold Harmsworth, Matt Aitken, and the Berry brothers, together controlled over half of all of the newspapers circulated in Britain, and that was back in the 1930s already. And so if we think just about Alfred Harmsworth and Harold Harmsworth, this is important. They had a press dynasty, the Amalgamated Press Publishing Company. And at that time, it controlled the Daily Mail, the Daily Mirror, the Observer and the Times. And it was the largest publishing company in the world. And it was Lord Northcliffe, Alfred Harmsworth, that really, really... Um, developed the methods of sensationalized press and trying to get it sold into the working classes uh, to build up large press space. And he started, before he died, exercising power over government on that, falling out with the government at, at some key points of policy and really starting to use that leverage. Um, he passed everything down, like I said before, to the first Viscount Rothermere, and this is important, because then Viscount Rothermere, and yes, he was the one who, who was the hurrah for the black shirts one, then passed it down to his eldest son, the second Viscount Rothermere, then to his son, the third Viscount Rothermere, who, um, who died suddenly in 1998 and passed it on to the current fourth Viscount Rothermere, uh, who was Jonathan Harmsworth, uh, who in inherited not only the controlling... Um, set of shares, but also the chairmanship of the Daily Mail group um, um, when he was 30 years old. So that hereditary power, uh, very anti-democratic, has, has of, of the Daily Mail and the Daily Mail group has traveled down all of those decades. Now, Lord Beaverbrook is another important one to talk about because he was the first to really enjoy the power of the big press. Uh, he was a Canadian, came over, um, really built up the Daily Express as a title during World War II. Um, I think he took up an important role in, in, in government, in the, um, in the weapons and arms uh, supply. I can't quite remember what his role was, but he was very important in government as well. But then after World War II ended, he made the Daily Express uh, the largest selling newspaper in the world um, with a colossal daily circulation. Uh, but importantly, he was very, very political. He promoted his friends with it. He attacked his enemies with it. Um, 
And um, he even said in front of a royal commission, quite brazenly, um, that he ran the papers purely for the purpose of making propaganda. Right. So there is your model of danger. And that that model continues through down the decades to in the late 1900s, where, of course, you see the the press extremely powerful um, in Britain and starting to brag you know, directly interfere um, with elections and brag that it tips elections, which causes um, those seeking election to try and suck up to the press. Now, there's lots of data on whether the Sun actually won it in 1992. It's very difficult to unpick it um, because obviously big press see to a degree which way the wind bl is blowing as well and you don't have enough samples of different instances to, to divvy it out so it's not known but certainly the press is enough in terms of power that it really does control a lot of dynamics that um, our politicians are prepared to engage in and certainly with Brexit you saw the huge effect that the press had on issues of immigration, and you saw the right-wing tabloid press certainly have a lot of influence in England and Wales, but it doesn't reach so much into Scotland or Northern Ireland, and those are areas that, that, that voted remain. Um, but the press also started getting into a lot more intimate relations with not just politicians but also with police and exercising powers that are outside of the law and this all came to a head in the Leveson inquiry in 2011 um, so a judicial public inquiry into the ethics of the British press and their power and it was designed to be in two parts one about the culture, practice and ethics, um, including as relates to uh, police and politicians. And then a part two, looking at the extent of unlawful and improper conduct, not just within News International, but also other media organisations. Um, and as you know, we haven't had Leveson too. And I think you also know why, because the press is so powerful that um, it can influence decisions that politicians make. And we won't go into Rupert Murdoch and Sky News and allegations around that, but clearly um, there is significant power here. That has worried people um, since the 1930s when the press barons, you know, aping the, the sort of like the robber barons of the Gilded Age in America, started becoming um, characters in the UK psyche that lots of people complained had far too much power. So, where are we now? Um, there's a fantastic report by the Media Reform Coalition um, looking at data now as to what is the degree of consolidation of the mainstream media and the big groups. And at the moment, um, just three companies, News UK, the Daily Mail, Mail Group and Reach, um, hold 90% of the national newspaper market. And this is up from 71% in 2015, and I think 80-something um, percent in 2017 or 18. They did another one in between those two. Um, furthermore, in local news, that is controlled by, um, largely controlled, 84% controlled by, by six companies. And in fact, I think just the first three of those uh, control two thirds of the local media. So there's been a hollowing out of independent local media and a gathering up of that local media by uh, sometimes uh, uh, non-British companies that just run them as a set and run them to a standard way of doing things without it being sort of locally um, uh, generated and run. 
It, that also works for uh, radio stations and control of radio stations with Bauer and Global really dominating there. And as you get into the era of social media, then um, Facebook, um, mm. back at the time this was done, uh, was still dominant. I think that's changing now because Facebook is really backing away from a lot of new sharing. But certainly social media platforms are becoming powerful in controlling the news and most of the news well about half the news that they still share is traditional but note that a lot isn't on social media and to come back to that top statistic those three companies dominate 90 percent of the national newspaper market and print press but when you get to online that drops to 80 percent so it's still high, but consider it from the other side, 10% to 20%, it's a doubling. So there's windows of opportunities opening up in the online space. Now, this echoes that, which is, and I love that first graph because I, I don't like the print press, but you've seen since just 2000, just over two decades now, a complete collapse in circulation of print press. The Sun, which was dominant uh, right through the end of the 90s to about 2010, um, has now really dropped off to the point whereby it doesn't like people knowing its circulation at the moment. Um, when we hit the, um, uh, the, the the COVID pandemic, they, start, they stopped telling us um, how many they were circulating, whereas other papers had a hit and bounced back and told us we don't have that for the sun. It also, of course, hit the Daily Mail um, to a similar degree, if not as dramatic as the sun. Um, and um, the Metro, which is free, you know, generally speaking, by, by virtue being free, is doing pretty well now comparatively, but people aren't buying hard copy papers anymore. Meanwhile, over a same over a very similar period of time, you're seeing remarkable growth in uh, the number of people that are spending a lot of time on Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp, Instagram, um, uh, Twitter, less so, but Twitter is very specialized for politics, so it gets reported in the news. So these social media platforms are increasingly becoming uh, the place where people actually gain access to their news, which is now increasingly online. And I didn't include here, maybe I, I should have done, some polling that I uh, did through um, Google surveys when it was publicly available at the time, um, just doing a public poll across the nation of where people get their news from, whether it's print press, TV, radio, social media, via friends, and what you see is that for the older generations, it's BBC TV and print press with some radio. Um, but for younger generations, it's it's social media and friends. And then secondarily, BBC TV and print press just isn't there. Um, so the way we get news is changing rapidly. Now, this was... Um, is complemented by the fact that the creators of content that you look at online is not it switched out from being the newspapers and now it's Facebook providing content for you, like a team at Facebook or a team at YouTube. The content provided by Facebook and YouTube and other channels is you and your friends and your colleagues and what you choose to share. And this was uh, seen at the time in 2006, when the time person of the year was you, was seen as, you know, a bit naff um, at the time and a bit kind of like fawning and trying to be cool. But actually looking back, it's really interesting, especially if you read this paragraph of it, uh, which is about the second paragraph. Look at 2006 through a different lens and you'll see another story, one that isn't about conflict or great men. And it was justifying why it's not putting, you know, great men um, up as the cover of person of the year. He said, 
It's a story about community and collaboration on a scale never seen before. It's about the cosmic compendium of knowledge of Wikipedia and the million channel people's network, YouTube, and the online metropolis, MySpace. Well, MySpace has since gone, but it's been replaced. It's about the many wresting power from the few and helping one another for nothing and how that will not only change the world, but also change the way the world changes. And that's very, very true, because if you think about the explosion of um, learning manuals on YouTube, on websites that are specific to different interest groups, and it's all this knowledge and writing and essays uh, being provided free. We don't have Encyclopedia Britannica anymore on our shelves, we can go and search up. So the vast free content provision is out there on the web. And importantly, news is starting to come in from people out there, which gets us into citizen journalism. Now, if you go into Google and search on the term citizen journalism, this picture or pictures like it of people holding up a smartphone in a crowd dominates all searches of citizen journalism. So this is this is the image of citizen journalism. And what really kicked it off is when the technology on people's phones got good enough to start getting good quality pictures. And that coincided with people being able to put them up on social media platforms like Facebook, like Twitter, like YouTube. And so everything from Iron Maiden concerts to um, Occupy protests, to the Arab Spring kicking off, where it was very hard to get journalists to the front lines, but you had people there, locals taking part in these protests, like, like the Maiden protests as well. You had people there filming this on their phones, filming events on their phones, and putting it up on social media. And so then you found the mainstream media trying to adapt to citizens providing the essential content of journalism, documenting what's going on in pictures, in video format, in their commentary. And you see that, um, like, for example, the New York Times said its use of images curated from people who are actually there, who are not their journalists, rose a hundredfold in a very short space of time. So then news outlets began not just relying on social media fora to disseminate um, the articles that they were producing, but also looking to social media fora to see what's going on that they could report on. And getting quotes from people out there or inviting people to send them in pictures, send them in personal experience and starting to write about that. And even more recently, just straight up quoting what politicians are saying on Twitter, now known as X. Speaking of which, that then opens up an opportunity for these social media platforms to say, hey, we are the news. Enter Mr. Cowboy himself, Elon Musk, singing up citizen journalism as he has. Look at me, here I am with a phone at the border doing citizen journalism. You too should be doing citizen journalism on X and you should be staying away from clicking through to mainstream media and all of their articles because everything you need to know could just be here on X, which is why he has recently changed the social media cards for publications like the Bylines Network, The Guardian, New York Times, whatever, to not have a title and the picture and the blurb but just to have the picture with a little link denoting that it is actually from a news site because he, like Facebook recently, wants to keep more and more people on his channel. So he has been talking a lot since 2022 when he acquired Twitter um, about Twitter pursuing the goal of elevating citizen journalism against media elites, empowering citizen journalism, Please encourage more citizen journalism. 
the world should engage citizen journalism. He has really been doing a big sell job on citizen journalism because he wants people to be putting their news content, their thoughts, opinions and updates and, and even scholarly work, uh, infographics up on Twitter. But how regulated is it? How is this like real journalism when you have to go through an editorial process, there are standard laws about, you know, uh, quality, um, accountability, you know, liability, all of that kind of stuff. So that's why we in the citizen journalism we're doing actually comes from a slightly different route. And I would say that, that we at the Bylines Network are trying to build regulated professional citizen journalism. And I have two major strands of inspiration for this, if you will. Firstly, Byline Times. Uh, Byline Times started out as byline.com when it was a website that was looking to support freelance journalists and freelance bloggers that were taking on the news that the mainstream media did not want to take on. And it was crowdfunding those journalists and bloggers to do that. So it was inviting the audience at large to say, what do you think needs investigating? And, or do you want to sponsor journalists and bloggers to do it? And one of the first things that started really taking off with byline.com was the Leveson inquiry and reporting on the naughty things, what all the press had been up to in a way that wasn't filtered through the mainstream media. And because that was so successful, that then got turned into um, not just the Byline Festival and, and, and you know other social aspects of Byline that got the audience and um, the journalists working together, but Byline Times, an actual printed publication that you can go out and get which very much helped build an alternative media that started doing well on social media, particularly in the, the, the pro-European, anti-government, anti-establishment audiences, particularly on Twitter. Um, and then the other strand of, of influence um, in the formation of the Bylines Network was the conversation. So this is an outlet that originated in Australia and essentially it curates articles from academics. So it invites academics to write about what they know about that could be of public interest, but it goes through an editorial process. Then it goes online on the site of the conversation, um, all, all fully professional done, professionally done like, like any normal article. And the whole thing is also regulated. It's press regulated. I think it's in press regulated, but I'll have to check. And so I approached um, Peter Dukes of Byline Times and I said, is there any chance that we could turn a whole load of active groups that I have seen and worked with throughout the UK doing local campaigning, local activism, they have strong online presences and they have an appetite for news, but are hitting the wall of the mainstream media. Is there any way they could be given their own titles to be putting out their own articles very much in the style of Byline Times, where it is professional, it is regulated, it looks just as good as mainstream media, but it's actually from our own community for our own community. And he said, yes. And he said, where would you start it? And I said, Yorkshire, because I know someone called Louise, who I really rate, and she wants to get into uh, local democracy and pushing for local democracy and local voices. So I think this would be a great mix. And so we took it, we took it from there and set up the Bylines Network um, in Yorkshire at first, but with all of this as a view to harnessing that ready-made audience that we had in our own largely pro-European community online at the time, across Twitter, across Facebook, um, and across networks of friends, taking that developed audience and saying, 
do you want an extra layer to your local Twitter campaigns and local Facebook campaigns? This can't be just purely pro-EU stuff. It actually has to be filling in the gap of local journalism, which we know has been hollowed out recently. And because it's been hollowed out recently, lots of people are at the whims of national press, which tends to push people towards extremes. There are data on that. We've seen that in the US. But can we fill in local journalism ourselves with our local voices, with our local control, but putting in it the editorial process with agreed standards, making sure it's all in-press regulated, make sure it's all given the presentation of standard newspapers so it's got that level of look and feel, maintain that across multiple different publications so people can see that it's, it's a set, it's a way of doing things, it's a standard, and then also think about the next generation of journalists bringing in students from universities, official placements there, so that you've 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 got the the support of other such entities, and then also bring in some high profile authors alongside the new authors, and thinking about increasing the diversity beyond just the white middle class southern base that really dominates. Uh, national conversation in the mainstream media. And so we think from here, we have developed a model of citizen journalism, which is far more advanced and well thought through than what Elon Musk is blasting out. And we think we're in a position where we can start trying to define what modern professional, powerful citizen journalism actually looks like with these standards, with these regulations, with um, with everything that we have prepped here. And we think that we can and should start going into universities and saying, would you like some courses or lessons on citizen journalism, how it can work, how it should work, how it should work going forward? Would you like to input to that? Because this is a community effort shaping it up. That's how we're built. You can do multiple online uh, courses for the same. You could even start offering this to Australia and the States. Would you like in your universities discussions of what citizen journalism actually is and actually what it could be? And then you see this becomes powerful citizen journalism also from our viewpoint as a community of starting to have community power in defining what we want to see and having that engagement globally as to what citizen journalism now could be after a couple of decades of it just being limited to people with their iPhones putting up content. We can really advance it so much more beyond this and be the ones that are the Hoover or are the big pens, or are the names synonymous uh, with this uh, growing new facility? So that's what I want to pitch to you all as a concept, um, that how we at the Bylines Network have got ourselves into a position where we have a unique working model in the world, and we can be bolder about trying to own that model and sell that model as a concept. And that's what I would very much like to discuss with all of you, because I think this is something that we can and should collectively own. Thank you very much.